Hey everyone, my name is Kara. And I'm Russ, and we are so glad you decided to join us today. And if you're new, we have something amazing to tell you about right now. It's called First Step. This is such a fun opportunity for us to get to know you and for you to come and meet some of our staff. We have an amazing dinner mm -hmm. that we provide for you and it's just a really fun time that we get to spend with you. You can find out all of the details of that on the MSC app. And what we're gonna do now is continue in our exegetical series on the book of John. Pastor Daniel has an amazing message waiting for you. But before we jump into God's word, let's take some time and worship together. Jesus, Jesus, you silence me, oh Jesus. 
Well, hey, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I'm Daniel. I serve on team here, and it is a pleasure to have you with us today. As was mentioned, today is part two in our expositional journey throughout the Gospel of John. And so it's a great weekend to be here, really, at the first tier as we go through the next six-month journey together through this inspired Evangelion, this incredible content from John's perspective about the life of Christ. Our church is in a great chapter. We love what it is that God is doing in and through the ministry of Mountain Springs, also the restoration work across the car park over there. It's just fantastic. I love what it is that God is doing. And so truly, you're joining us at a great time. Throughout this series, we're going to tackle some of the most inspired, most relevant, most revelatory even passages found in the New Testament. From John 3, 16, that will be our passage for Easter this year. Also John 10, 10, that in Christ we can have life and have it abundantly. John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through sacrifice of Christ and our acceptance of that sacrifice in terms of new life coming into our lives. Then obviously John 20 and John 21. John 20, uh, the incredible chapter of the resurrection John 21, breakfast on the beach with Jesus. I'm telling you, what a great way to end the entire series. That is Peter's primacy. That is the time of this incredible moment where Jesus looks into the eyes there as they are having breakfast together. Incredible, incredible. That's all to come. Essentially, John's gospel focuses on the last three years of the life of Christ. And by doing so, really creates this stunning portrait of who Christ is. This incredible image, this incredible uh, textual diagram, if you will, this pictorial look at who the life of Christ is, and it's this stunning image, stunning portrait. And so much so, I want to invite you to commit your life to the next six months of this journey. Yes, it is six months, and yes, it is 26 weekends, 24 after this one right now, but it's going to be a long journey. But give your life to it, and here's why. This past week, I was reading a new report that has come out of Harvard Uni uh, University to where they're calling it the program of human flourishing. The program of human flourishing. There is too much in the report that I could tell you right now. You can Google it and learn more. But essentially, what they are doing is they are identifying the undeniable correlation between really pursuing God in your life and the rising quality of life. So much so, uh, they quote a lot of statistics. I won't regale you those right now, but essentially stronger social support, stronger friendships, higher levels of peace, better mental health, lower rates of depression, greater sense of meaning and purpose, et cetera, and so on and so forth. And I read those and I was like, well, sure. No great surprise there. But then they have something that did pique my interest. And I'm going to quote it. And I quote, here it is. An interesting aspect of the religious participation research is that it suggests that it is religious service attendance rather than self-assessed spirituality or religiosity or private practices that most powerfully predict health and well-being. Most accurately predict life and health and well-being. In other words, being together really matters. Church community matters. Creating this context of life-on-life discipleship really matters. So, in short, yes, this is going to be a long series, but do yourself a favor. Pay attention to the research and forge new habits of faith throughout this series. Why? Because in a very real way, your life depends upon it. It really does. Your life depends upon it. But today we're going to be in verse 6 through verse 34 in John 1. If you were with us last weekend, we kicked off this series with the first five verses. We should have gotten to verse 18. We didn't. So strap on, hold on. We're going to get to verse 34 today uh, as we really lock in and orient around this incredible passage over the next 24 or so hours. But let's... uh, Let's just see, okay, how this goes. God, we pray that right now you would speak in this moment. We, we avail ourselves to the truth of your word. And right now, we position as needed, reposition our lives to not stand in authority over the word, but to sit under the teaching and the authority of the word. We repent of those times where we have sought to profess that we know best. We repent of those times of trying to figure out this solution or this situation on our own. Spirit of God, right now, would you speak? We know that you do speak. You communicate. You reveal yourself through those things seen in the natural, but also those things seen and discerned in the supernatural realm. So, Spirit of God, speak. 
May our lives through the inerrancy of the word be aligned to the life of Christ to bring glory to the Father through the ongoing empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So we pray for this kingdom encounter and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. John 1 verse 6. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. We're going to hear a lot about a guy, a fellow by the name of John today, but every time we hear of the term John or the name John in John's Evangelion, this is not John the Apostle or John the author speaking of himself. This is John the Apostle speaking of John the Baptist, John the Baptist. But who is this fellow then that has this denominational moniker connected to his name? Because there is no Mike the Methodist, there is no Pete the Presbyterian, there is Nick or Nigel the non-denominational. So what makes this guy so relevant? Is he the founder of IBC, the Israeli Baptist Convention? He is not, fear not, fret not. He simply is named such because that is what he did. He slammed people into the silty, dirty River Jordan and called them to repentance and baptized them in a very powerful way. So who is he? Well, John the Baptist is mentioned, frankly, more so in the New Testament than many other figures. 85 times John the Baptist is mentioned directly or indirectly in the New Testament. And Jesus himself was the one that said in Matthew 11:11 11, 11, that among those born of women, John the Baptist is the greatest. And yet with all of his significance and with all of the prominence that he has and carries in the New Covenant, Really, John the author, John the apostle, really doesn't speak much of John the Baptist. And to learn more about uh, JTB, we have to go into the synoptics. We have to look into, it's just too long to say John the Baptist. Who's got time to say that? Acronym, baby. I'm like anointed by a spirit of military men and women. Just acronyms coming upon me. But how is it that we need to learn about JTB? We have to go to the Synoptics. And the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are where we find so much about this man that was known as John the Baptizer. And so much so, we know that he was born to an aging priest and his equally mature, see what I did there, wife. And she was the one that brought forth John the Baptist. And really, this, this incredible icon that he grew into be because of this one thing. John the Baptist took a Nazarite vow. And a Nazarite vow is the vow to where you do not touch a dead body, you don't partake in Molbeck, even though it's the best red wine. In fact, no alcohol can touch your lips. And also, you're never allowing scissors or a trimmer to go near your hair to where you have long hair. You just let your hair grow. So much so. While John the Baptist is one of the most iconic individuals in the New Testament, he is also, frankly, one of the strangest to picture in your mind. Long hair, a wanderer there in the Judean desert, south of Jerusalem, I'm telling you, if you were a father in that day and you had a daughter, you probably didn't want the two to meet up. Do you get what I'm saying right now? Like you don't want to see what that grandchild's going to look like. But anyway, John the Baptist was quite a figure, quite an appearance, quite a looker, quite a looker. Ladies, you missed out. But all of that being said, this past week on Monday when I was building the notes for this weekend, I started to kind of play around in my mind of if John the Baptist were to create an online dating profile, how would it read? If he were on Match.com, I had to Google that, by the way, because those days are long gone for me. But I had to Google, what is an online dating site? Match.com, this is JTB on Match.com. So hair, very long, unkept, and worn like a hedge. Attire, modeling a coat like a windswept tent. Skin, cracked from way too much beach and not enough ocean time. Diet, anything which crawls and hides under rocks. Lady, you missed out. Ladies, you really did. Where were you when he was single? There it is. As humorous as that is, though, it is somewhat accurate. And now let's pivot from being silly to preaching. Here's the point. While we sometimes think, wow, he was quite a person to behold, the reality is... Oftentimes, when God seeks to do a new thing or move in a new direction, God will oftentimes overlook tradition and decorum and reach beyond the realm of the religious elite or the religious established. Why? Here is the principle. New wine placed into an old wineskin destroys both the wineskin and the wine. And in that same way, while 1 Samuel 16, 7, I believe it is, that says this, that while we look at the outward, God looks at the heart. And there is something about John the Baptist that God saw his heart. A man who lived all alone in the Judean desert, but yet walked with God in a very, very intimate way. God saw his heart. The point is that I want to really draw out in this moment, and that is this, that you might feel like you've been overlooked. You might feel like your face doesn't fit. You might feel like your story doesn't work. 
You might look back upon your life and go, well, that was my situation. I was in incarceration or that was my situation and I'm divorced. While you cannot change your story, the life of Christ overcomes the weight of that story. And oftentimes you allow your past to define your life. The reality is, even with Christ, that story now is describing what you have gone through. But there is a big difference between describing and defining. Describing is merely the pictorial display of what it is that you have gone through. Defining is that you allow that image to define what is yet to come. Don't allow your story to define you. Don't allow your image to define you. Don't allow what it is when you truly come to a point of where you say, God, I'm going to surrender my heart to you. Think of King David for a moment. A sex offender, a murderer, a person that at times thought, I can figure this out on my own. A man that should have been out to battle but was cruising at home. A man that blew it in so many ways, but yet he says, God has yet to overlook and deny a heart that is broken and contrite. Meaning, God doesn't look the way we look. He doesn't see what it is that we see. He pays attention to the deeper things. And we should do likewise. But I want to say this right now to you. If you feel like you don't fit, you do fit. If you feel like you've been defined and you've been excluded, you haven't, you've been included and you've now been empowered. And that is the calling of God upon your life. So much so, in his late 20s or early 30s, this zealot of a young man stepped out onto the public scene and made quite a scene. Verse 7 says that he was really calling that all might believe. The good news of that phrase is that all includes you and I. That we might believe in Jesus. But then look how the author speaks of John the Baptist in verse 8. He says, he was not the light. By the way, this is the job description of every believer, leader, and pastor. The job description is to see that you are not the light, but you come to bear witness about the light. Unfortunately, all too often in the 21st century, especially in the Western developed world, where we should be quick to deflect praise and be quick to accept criticism, we invert the two. We pursue the praise and we deflect the criticism. And in many ways, we want to be the center of the story and we don't want to speak of the one who is the redeemer of all story. And we want to be in that place and we want to step into that place. And I want to speak over you right now and just say, make sure you live your life to go out of the way to put others on the stage and make sure they're center. But more than that, make sure that you live in such a way to where you put all praise to the one who has redeemed all things in your life. Point to Jesus, point it back to Jesus. So much so we then pivot back to Jesus. Verse nine, the true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He, verse 10, Jesus was in the world and the world was made through him. Again, that goes back into Genesis one and two from last weekend. But then look what John says, yet. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, speaking of Israel, but also speaking to the religious elite, those who had memorized great portions of the Torah, arguably knew God best and yet pursued his new thing the least. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. As sad as that verse is in terms of the context of which it was written, in the same way of which we can now apply it to our context today, it is equally sad it is equally sad that sometimes we can get so caught up in the adherence of rules or the following faith as a formula or projecting an image. How are you? I'm great because I need to project an image because I don't want you to really see what's happening on the inside of me. In that same way, it says that they missed God. They rejected him. Well, now let's kind of put that into our 21st century context. Friends, as we go through this series, this is week two, of 26 weeks, as we go through this series, don't get church and miss Jesus. Amen. Jesus is here, but we can easily miss him. And as much as the Harvard report speaks about attendance creating this new transformation in our lives, you should know, as I already know, that it is not attendance that transforms our lives, it's repentance that transforms our lives. It is not showing up, it is turning over your life. It's not checking a box, it's allowing your heart to be checked. It's about that happening in our lives. But don't get church and miss Jesus. You know, we can become so proficient in doing church. We know where to park and 
We know how to check the kids in. We know, we know which hallway to use because one has more traffic and it's like salmon. You don't want to swim upstream. You want to come this way. You just know and you just get church so well. You know where to find arguably some of the best coffee in the community. And you go there and you pull it in your garden. And you go back for a third or fourth cup. And then you come in and you sit down in the seat that Jesus assigned to you at his death upon Calvary. And you're like, that is the seat he gave to you. And if we're not careful, we can get so church dialed in and we can miss Jesus. Some of you even here right now, or even those of you online right now, you might even be wondering right now, well, I go to church for my kids. Can I tell you right now, if your kids make a profession of faith, it does nothing for you on Judgment Day. Nothing. He's not going to go, well, you kind of get in by proxy. You don't even get in by proximity. You get in through intimacy. That's the reality. The reality is when you surrender your heart to him, so much so we then come back to John here in a little bit, but let me see verse 12. To all who did receive him, who believe in his name, Jesus, he gives the right to become children of God. This is adoption, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The scripture is written in three languages, Hebrew, Hebrew, Uh, Greek and then Aramaic. And the Greek word here, in terms of the translation of which we have in our English, this is one of those places where the English language, as excellent as it is, I might say. (laughs) And you're welcome. We have allowed you to utilize (laughs) the Lord's language. Um, But in this regard, I have to say this. My father-in-law, who is American, my father-in-law has an ongoing joke. He says, while the English created the language, the Americans perfected the language, so deal with it. And I'm like, it's just not very nice. But with this being said, the English word here that we translate believe can become very whimsical in its usage. But in the Greek word, there is a weight to it that it entirely eclipses the way we use the word believe. We can use the word believe in Um, you say to your spouse, I'm getting off work at 2.45, I believe I can be there around three o'clock so I can get the kids at 3.10. And you use belief in a whimsical way, but the word here for belief in this context is the word posterior, posterior, and it speaks about this absolute, utter dependence upon where you bank your life upon it, where you believe. Not in a, I think I'll be there on time. No, 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 if this doesn't work, I'm done for. This absolute belief. Now, I want you to visualize this word with me, and I'm going to kind of invent a word. It's Sunday morning, so we get to invent words. Um, You are currently posteroing on something. I am not, incidentally, but all of you are. You are posteroing upon your chair. And while you don't know much about the chair that you are seated upon, you don't know the quality, the fine quality of the Chinese steel that it is fabricated from. (laughs) You don't know... You don't know the welder that did the seams. You don't know the strength of the welding. You don't know the capacity or the competency of the welder. You don't even know where it was built. I personally have a degree in chairology. I know where we bought them. I know how many there are in the room. I know the distance between the front chair and the back chair in order to get this many people in. I have a degree in chairology. And yet when you came in with very little knowledge of the chair, you placed your postero and posterior upon it. You literally sat upon it and you didn't think, I hope this can hold me. You just slumped down upon it and placed the entire weight and shape of your life upon it. You entirely placed everything of your life upon it. You are posteroing currently. In that same way, John says, don't just think upon Jesus like I think I'll be there in time. Rather say, I've received by grace and now through faith, I postero. I'm going to stay here because it can hold the weight of my life. And John says, all of this is possible because of verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Friends, our God is neither distant nor abstract. And while in the Old Testament he comes in mysterious ways of a pillar of fire and a dream or a vision or in some way of a supernatural presence or a bush that burned yet was not consumed, what we see in the New Testament is the word flesh, which is the word incarnation, which is where we get the word carne, carne, which is, as you would imagine, carne asada. It's true. (laughs) Wait, it's this belief. It's this belief in terms of blood, bone, ligament, meat, flesh. He came as such. And to deny the reality that Jesus came in bodily form 
is actually 1 John 4 to become like a false teacher. John says, as Paul also reiterates to the church in Colossae, where he writes this, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, we are saved based upon the nature of God becoming man, yet while being tempted, not sinning, going as a pure and spotless lamb, we'll come back to that in a moment, to satisfy the curse, to pay the price, one man's life exchange for all. He came and laid down his life for us. Well, this also has Genesis creation undertones. If you were here with us last weekend, we talked about how the pinnacle of creation is the creation of man made in the image of God to be the image of God. Well, here in John, we see now the, the beginning, the inauguration, the start of the new creation being a flip. Now humanity is saved through God coming in the image of man. The two work together and the symbolism is rich throughout all of this moment. And so much so, John bore witness of this. Verse 15, and he cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me. Now pay attention to the wording here and I'll explain it. He who comes after me, now that's speaking chronologically, ranks before me, that's speaking of authority, because he was before me. So what John is doing here right now is he is mixing the third dimension with the fourth dimension. We live in the third dimensional realm. We see 3D, but God functions in the fourth dimensional realm. And there are times where he will pull back the curtain of the fourth dimensional realm, where we get a glimpse into all that will come in the fulfillment of the new creation. He'll pull back the curtain, we see a miracle. Or the greatest miracle of someone coming to faith. And then the curtain closes again. And then we function again in the three dimensional realm. What John the author is doing here is he is speaking about the three-dimensional realm that Jesus was six months younger than John the Baptist, but he has preeminence because he is eternal, thus he has pre-existence. So what John the author is saying is even though the baptizer came first, the Messiah ultimately came first, so he gains the authority in this moment. Then he goes on to say, for from his fullness... We have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, yet Jesus has made him known. There are some words there speaking of grace and law, law and grace. I want you to think about law this way. Sometimes it's hard for people to wrap their minds around what is the law and why do we have the law? What is the purpose of the law? If you can't keep the law, why have the law? Think of it this way. Think of the last time you were in the mountains and you were either on skis or a snowboard or you were on some sort of motorized vehicle and all of a sudden you see a pine tree coming towards you and it's not moving, you are, but it feels like it's hurtling towards you and all of a sudden you black out and you look down when you finally come around and all of a sudden your leg is perpendicular to your knee. You're like, this is not good. You go into a shark, all of a sudden the person who's with you takes you and you go to the clinic. You wait long enough for them to look at the leg and they go, oh, you've got to be seen. And they take you into, what well, they would need to, I don't know, but they take you in to see the x-ray technician. And you're there and you're like, I'm pretty sure visually you can see what's going on. And they do an x-ray on your leg and all of a sudden the technician says, yep, it's broken. And yep, I can tell you where it's broken. That's the law. The law shows you where you're broken and it shows you how you broke yourself but then you would be a fool if you looked at the x-ray technician and said, okay, bro, let's go, fix this. Because the technician would look at you and go, you're going to have to see a surgeon. All I can do is show you where you're broken and how bad it's broken. But you're going to have to see the surgeon. All of a sudden, the surgeon walks in and the surgeon says, we can totally get that fixed up. It's going to require a knife and some bloodshed and it's going to require some breaking it back. But then all of a sudden, once you heal up after the bloodshed, after the work of the knife, all of a sudden, you're going to be better. That is Jesus. Through bloodshed, you are saved. That is the work of an x-ray and that is the work of grace. And so when John says there is a law that comes in terms of the Mosaic law, but then grace upon grace, in other words, blow your mind. You don't just have to know you're broken. You now can know the way to be cleaned up and healed. Through blood spilling, you will experience life healing. 
And that is the way it works through Jesus. So much so, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, God made him who knew not sin, Jesus, to take upon the sin of our lives so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This next section is almost in parentheses. It's almost parenthetical as it relates to John the author then says, this is what John the Baptist always said about Jesus. He says, this is the testimony of John. In other words, this is what John always knew to be true about Jesus. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So the context is this. In our nomenclature, there is a church on the north side of town and it's growing faster than our church. So we go over there and go, what is it that you're doing? What is it that you're doing differently? Who are you talking about? Are you watering down the gospel? Like what is going on here? Why is it that people wanna come to your church and not to our church? So in gist, it's kind of what's happening here. It's not so much the issue of why they go. The bigger issue is what it is that they ask of John the Baptist. They ask him, are you Elijah? Well, why did they ask him that? If you know, allow me to kind of go into a deeper level for a moment, track with me. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. The final two verses in the Old Testament, two cryptic verses that speak about Elijah will come and Elijah coming will precede the great and mysterious day of the Lord when then Elijah would call the people to have the hearts of the fathers turn towards the children and the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Well, if you know Old Testament and you know the New Testament, if you think about it visually in terms of your paper Bible, you've got Malachi, Malachi 4, 5 and 6, and then there's nothing beneath that but white space. Then if you look to the right visually in your mind, you've then got a page that says New Testament or the term covenant. Essentially, on the left is all about man trying to get back to God through one way or another and the sacrifice of many animals and much blood spilling. And on the right, the new covenant, the covenant of Christ coming, one man's sacrifice for the ultimate atonement of all. But yet, if you look at Malachi, there's that white space. And then it goes to Matthew 1.1. And if you don't know this, you won't realise the significance Between the last verse of Malachi and the first verse of Matthew is 400 years of dial tone silence. And then all of a sudden, Matthew. (laughs) Matthew chapter one, verse one, starts a whole new thing. But in those 400 years, those who knew God the best and claimed to understand the Torah the most recognised this one thing. Before the Messiah can come, Elijah should return to call the hearts to be transformed. So much so they go and they say, are you Elijah? Well, here's what you need to know. To this very day, if you were to walk in the streets of Tel Aviv right now, or Haifa or wherever you are in Israel, they are still waiting for Elijah to come for the Messiah to then follow. So much so, they ask him, are you Elijah? Well, the answer to this question is two plus two equals 4.24. Meaning, the New Testament is somewhat mysterious and cryptic as to is John the Baptist the same person as Elijah? The reason there is questions there is because 2 Kings 2, I believe it is, Elijah didn't really die like the rest of us will. He kind of was like taken to heaven in a chariot. So much so, he didn't really die. So is this Elijah? Elijah, if you don't know, was kind of like the godfather of the prophetic in the Old Testament. He was like the bee's knees. He even had a school of the prophetic, raised up a whole lot of little pea prophets everywhere. Just like, go do your thing, go change the world and all that. Well, he was kind of the big cheese. All of that goes to heaven. Did he return? And the question is, is John the Baptist Elijah? Well, that is something that will require a lot of study. Part of me goes, maybe not. Maybe so, because even John the Baptist himself says, no, I'm not Elijah. But maybe he was like, no, I'm not Elijah. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of kind of cryptic layers of language and meaning and understanding there, but he definitely had the spirit of Elijah. Definitely the spirit of Elijah. And he calls people to repentance. And truly, hearts were turning. 
Lies are changing. Verse 25, so they ask him again, then why are you baptizing in the dirty river Jordan? That's me adding into the passage. If you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. And then, kingdom drum roll. Verse 29, the next day, He saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. We're going to come back to that. Who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me. Remember, preeminence because of preexistence. Because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold is a biblical word that is used in context to essentially communicate, stop what you're doing, whatever it is that you're doing, and listen for this next statement. It's like verily or can I get your attention, please? Behold the Lamb of God. When we think of a lamb in our context, we think about this cute and cuddly white and fluffy animal that is upon the shoulder of a shepherd. And while we maintain that visual of a white and fluffy living animal, in that context, in first century Jewish context, a lamb was never white and fluffy, but red and dead. Why? Because the lamb represented the sacrifice of the Passover. The lamb was the animal that was taken on the night of where the Exodus and the people of Israel, are under all of their slavery, were set free from their years and years of slavery to go towards their land of promise, the promised land. And if you recall, there was this dark and demonic force that came over and it was going to kill all of the firstborn. So much so, the father went to the son and said, hey, go get that lamb. He's like, what did that lamb do to deserve death? Go get that lamb. Why? Well, speaking to the firstborn son, he then says, well, because this is what's going to happen. We're going to go towards our freedom, but we're going to take that lamb and we're going to sacrifice that lamb And we're going to take the blood of that lamb and we're going to put it over the doorpost and the lentil. The son says to the father, I don't think that's fair. And he says, trust me, it will save your life. Okay, go over there. And he gets the lamb and he brings the lamb back to the father. And sure enough, they put blood. It's the Exodus. You know it to be the Exodus. What is John's point? There is a new Exodus. And those people that have been enslaved to a whole new degree of slavery, not trying to build bricks without resource, but trying to live life without hope. And the effect of slavery upon our lives will be paid as the great Passover lamb, the lamb of God, will lay down his life. In John's gospel, the very afternoon when they're killing the lambs for the Passover, Jesus himself will lay down his life. The symbolism in the Exodus through the firstborn son providing of a lamb for the lamb blood to ensure covering. In that same way, we are now covered by the blood of the lamb. We are set free from our slavery. We are set free and it is the new Exodus. And here's the difference. Where it was many lambs for the life of one nation, it is now one lamb for the lives of every nation. That we can be free. And how do, you, how do you know this? And how did John know this? Well, it tells us in the passage, verse 32, and John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Come on. And it remained on him. And he goes, I myself didn't know him. But he who sent me, the Father, to baptize with the water, said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with fire of the Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is, is the Son of God. Behold the Lamb of God slain that the new Exodus throughout all of the new creation might be displayed. Say yes to Jesus. Don't say yes to the church. Don't say yes to a formula. Say yes to faith and say yes to the one who died for you. No one here on this team has died for you. Nothing we could do here can procure salvation for you. It is all dependent upon you saying simply yes and allowing your life to be upheld by the strength of that which you place your belief. It is not when you sit down metaphorically 
the manner of which you are seated that sustains you, but by the strength of that which is beneath you. Trust the strength of that which is beneath you. That Jesus Christ died and rose again and was victorious and cooked breakfast for His friends on the beach and said, behold, I shall come and I will reclaim all things and restore all things and make them like new again, Revelation 21 and 22. There is an exodus. You can be free from slavery. Say yes to Jesus today. Let's pray. Father, we honour You. And we recognise that when we realise the work of Christ on the cross counted for us and we count upon it, we are counted as children of God. So we wanna put our faith and trust in You by grace, not through our works, not through our effort, not through our hard work or our formula, but through simply faith. We are saved. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been an amazing series so far. We can't wait to continue it next week. We love you guys. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next time.